Hey guys, I'm going to do a video series. I'll put it in a playlist. Uh, I've sent many of you a PDF book. Uh, I think it's Michael Bowen is the author. He's given me permission to freely give this book out. It, it's hundreds of pages. The man did tremendous work on this. And it's called I Never Knew You. And it shows how so many of these huge television preachers have subtly corrupted the gospel. All right? He gives you the real gospel, and the reason it's I never knew you is that we know that those people, those it's talking about false prophets, the context is, but those people are boasting in their works to Jesus, but Lord, Lord, didn't I preach in your name, didn't I cast out demons in your name, didn't I do many wonderful works, and he'll say, depart from me, you that work iniquity, I never knew you, of course their works are iniquity, because they never trusted in Christ, and therefore the sin is still on their account. Someone said, they were cast out for iniquity because they were sinners. Oh, you think you don't sin anymore? That's why you're saved? Get out of here. You don't even know how much you sin. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. It's way up here. It's just holy and good, but can't make you just holy and good. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're falling from grace. It also says, Christ is of no effect to you, whosoever you're justified by the law. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified to sight, for by the law is not just sin. And it says that if you offend in one, you offend in all, and then you're under the curse. All right? The law was given to stop our mouths, to make us guilty before God, to be a schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. Why so many try to insert in the gospel, I will never understand, except there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof the ways of death. So let me give you a couple verses, then I'm going to go right into this man's book. And then I'll do one video for each of these teachers and try to put it in a playlist because it's very long. Uh, Luke 12, 1. We are warned. In the meantime, there were gathered together innumerable multitudes of people, and so much that they trod upon one another. He began to say upon <coughs> unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Uh, he was just saying that those that teach the law, they themselves don't keep it. Uh, and it tells us um, about the subtlety that beguiled Eve. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. I don't know what happened to that there. But we're going to pull that up. I had it pulled up. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, I probably shut it. All right, so um, here is 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. He doesn't want them to to believe anybody else, or to believe a false gospel. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That means that you're not committing adultery with another Jesus or another gospel. Okay? But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, subtle, very subtle, it's not going to be overt, okay? He's not going to come with horns and or the preacher's not going to come drunk with it. No, no, no. He's going to look like a man of God. He's going to have doctors of theology. He's going to wear a three-piece suit. But he's just going to change something. He might change what the word repent means. Repentance unto life to turn to Christ in faith. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. He might say you got to repent of your sins, which is keeping the law, ad law, secret. That is the biggest false gospel out there right now, you guys. See, repentance of sin is something a saved person does every day for the rest of their lives. We don't even think about sin. We just look at Jesus and the sin kind of falls off because we're not you know, thinking about the law anymore because the strength of sin is the law. So he says, I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's the purity. In Christ what he did that his death burial and resurrection gives you eternal life I just did the video about the last Adam how the last Adam was the only one that could restore what the first Adam messed up that's why your works have nothing to do with it he's the one that fixed what Adam messed up for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus like he's not divine or he's just created you know father restored me the glory I had with you before the world was uh, he's all over the Old Testament the Son of God, the Son of Man, and Daniel's vision, uh, one like a Son of God with Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fire, 
uh, one visiting Abraham, God in the flesh with two angels, the one that wrestled with Jacob, that was God himself, he wrestled with God, um, and they preached that, you know, he just, he didn't, he, he's like just another prophet or something, like the Muslims, it's another Jesus, okay, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, like dogs barking and crawling around on the floor and shaking and doing this. That's not the spirit of the Holy Spirit because he has, so he, the fruit of him is self-control and sound mind, okay? Which you have not received or another gospel which you've not accepted, you might well bear with them. See, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15. It's spelled out. It's the one that saved us. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, According to the scriptures, it's right behind me, okay? And that because he did that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have imputed righteousness because he wore our sin. He didn't have any. We get God's righteousness, and we don't have any. So it, it's an amazing gift. So they might bring something else uh, uh, to you. And so that's what's happening so let's go over this man's book. It's pretty amazing. He, the first thing he opens with is he's quoting Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not every, see, these false prophets look at this and go, see, you got to stop sinning. You got to have more works. I don't know how they get that. It's about false prophets boasting in their own works. And Jesus saying he didn't know them, that you got to do the will of the father. But the will of the father is that all who see the son believe on him. All right. The Bible interprets itself. You don't add your own interpretation. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can't you hear the Jehovah's Witness saying that? But Lord, I knocked on doors for you. But Lord, they have another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's that? To believe on him, to trust in him. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That means preach. And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work inequity. Because your works are iniquity. You don't have any good works to offer him if you're not saved. They don't get it. And this is about the context of false prophets, by the way. Not saved believers. Uh, and then this book, I'm trying to go down. It won't. All right, I'm trying to scroll down and it won't go down. Here we go. All right, then he continues at the great white throne judgment. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. See, there's no fear for people that trust in Jesus. We trust our Savior saved us. Simple and true. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. By the way, it's not the God of the uh, dead, but the God of the living. These are not saved people. And another book was open, which is the book of life. So they're looking at the lives of these people. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Okay? We're not, we're not judged according to our works. We're rewarded for our works once we're saved, but we're not into heaven because of our works. But those that are lost will be judged according to their works. Okay? And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, that's death in the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them. Because hell is uh, translated from Sheol or Hades, which is the dwelling of the dead, grave. Delivered up the dead which were in them, and they which were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. It's destroyed in the lake of fire itself. And this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. So uh, that's the warning he gives about us not knowing the Lord. So he writes this uh, like pre like intro about the agony of not being sure. And he writes, the misery of believing in a false gospel is really a misery like no other. By the way, I got another girl in the hospital for attempted suicide because of lordship salvation. You guys don't believe me. A lot of don't. A lot of people don't. That this lordship kills people. <laughs> Ta -da! Slit wrist. All right? Because it takes all hope because the law makes us so guilty. It did its job. It's supposed to make you guilty. But the prescription is God's 
unconditional love and grace through the finished work of Christ, which somebody should have preached to them and to me. Thank God somebody did. All right. Uh, and, and people don't realize those of us that are seeking God and really want peace and are given a false gospel, it kills us. And it says, our media is filled with sharp, well-meaning individuals who, without realizing, teach biblically flawed plans of salvation that aren't even found in the Bible. The flawed plans report that sinners can reach heaven through their own merits or by combinations of faith in Christ plus their own works and deeds. And that's the big one. All right? To repent of your sins, which is nowhere in Scripture. Paul tells him, he commands all men to repent. Of what? Their idolatry. He's talking to pagans. I mean, you got to look at uh, context. He's saying, don't trust in your idols, trust in the living God through Christ. Just crazy how they've twisted that word. That's the subtlety that beguiles Eve. He said, the purpose of the story is twofold. Firstly, is to help you know beyond any doubt whatsoever the truth of what Christ says about the gift of salvation. Secondly, it's to help arm you with the knowledge necessary for you to be able to detect what is perhaps the greatest weapon against mankind in the arsenal of our adversary. To con people into living the Christian lifestyle without ever being born again. I have done a video on that. That's Holy Spirit right there. Because I have said the exact same thing. The greatest trick of the devil is to make people live the Christian life and they're never saved. Never born again. Never born of God. And they walk in this hypocrisy. All right. All right. He's, he's going to tell you this man's story. So this will be like the intro to these. I'll give you. All, I'll, I'll give you a, a video on each chapter of this. I won't read the, the whole chapter, but each person, each, this is not to insult these preachers. This is not to accuse them. It's to show them that even through maybe their own, uh, they don't even know they're doing it. But they, through the subtlety that beguiled Eve, they're giving you another gospel. And these are big time preachers that have big shows. And by the way, they're loved by the world, most of them. And that's pretty scary. <coughs> uh, I found... One true gospel church in my, we are like the king of churches here in the south, Bible Belt. Every one of them a false gospel. Two years, a man of God moved here. He was under Jack Hiles. A lot of people accused Jack Hiles because his enemy said a lot of things, but he was right on the gospel. And my pastor was taught under him that my pastor didn't even have, uh, hold hands or have a kiss until he, his altar at his wedding. And people want to accuse my pastor. He is truly a man of God, but he is on the right gospel. It took me two years to find it. Guess how many people we have about members? Around 35, 40. Do you see? Narrow is the way. Why is it narrow? Because Jesus is the way. All right? It's not a process. It's a person. Okay, so here's this man's story. A man who was led by his college professors to believe that there was no God at all reached out to him one day in complete desperation. Oh, by the way, most people lose their faith as a freshman in college because uh, college professors tell you the magic man in the sky. You're an idiot for believing that. I'm so smart. Until you tell them, okay, so wait, there was nothing, and then that nothing exploded, and supposedly nothing was in a little ball that we can't even see, and it turned into this giant mass into the universe. I was like, it's just crazy. It doesn't even make sense. All right, so... Uh, cause nothing is nothing. It doesn't turn into something. Uh, he both listened to and watched today most popular Christian evangelists, trusting every word they spoke. Realizing his need to be born again, he followed the directives of all these well-known pastors. This poor man asked Jesus into his heart, tried his best to turn from his sins, and he crowned Christ as the Lord of his life. The man literally changed overnight. See, by the way. Uh, AA changes your life too. A lot of programs change your life, but it doesn't mean you're born again. All right. In the beginning, everything was perfect. In fact, it was all much more than he expected it to be. Uh, this man was getting prayers answered. He was getting returns on his tithes. This man began buying Bibles for his friends, telling them about Christ, attending church, tithing, and even sending money to the pastors who had instructed him. But despite the visible changes in this man, he was not truly born again. I see this all the time. They get convicted of their sin. They know they're guilty. So then they hear about Jesus, but they don't hear the real gospel. And they think they got to clean up their life to come to Christ. So they get real down about their business. They're getting rich. You better get serious and get real business about your salvation here. Like Ray Comfort. Do it again and mean it this time. What? 
Jesus did it and really meant it because he went to the cross. That's crazy. You don't do it again and mean it this time. Just ridiculous. All right. So despite the changes, he was never truly born again. Since the devil also had the power to do miracles, this man's faith had unknowingly been intercepted by an all too common counterfeit version of the gospel. Shortly afterward, he began doubting his salvation. Good. <laughs> Thank God he did. Now, I don't believe in save people doubting. I think they should be in the word of God so that nothing can shake them. He asked Christ to come into his heart again. See, you don't ask for what he's already offered. When you trust what Christ did, he does live in you. It tells you that. See, the Christ is in you. The next three years witnessed this miserable man to asking Christ into his heart literally thousands of times. Yet he never had biblical assurance of his salvation. What exactly happened to this man? God reached out to him with the true gospel in its superlative simplicity. He was saved eternally the instant that he trusted on Christ alone to save him. Uh, watch my last Adam video so you can understand why he works. got nothing to do with it. And it must be Christ alone. I know this because I am, in fact, that same man to whom I've been referring. All right? He's talking about himself, people. He knows what he's talking about. Oh, man. It's same thing. I've seen this happen so many times. I got Mormons. I got pastors that have gotten saved on this channel. I've gotten Catholic priests that have saved on this channel. This is amazing. Christ said, it's not me. It's the word of God. Christ's promise of eternal life is to everyone who believes his gospel message. He saves you forever the instant you trust in him. Here's the gospel. God says that we're sinners and no amount of good works or behavioral changes on our part could ever make us holy enough to enter heaven. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what Isaiah said. That's where we need to be. God sent his son to pay for all of our sins. Jesus paid for our crimes by dying on the cross for us all. His dead body was buried in a grave. And on the third day, Jesus arose from the dead. The instant you believe this, he knows it and he saves you. See, when you believe that he did that to give you eternal life, you're trusting in him. God says you got to believe the report of his son that he gives us eternal life and that life is in his son. You have eternal life and it's eternal. He who believes the son hath life. He who believes not the son hath not life and the wrath of God abides on him. It's that simple. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. God didn't forget people. Don't believe these people and man's uh, fair, what is it, fair word, feigned words and fair speeches. All right. The instant you believe this, he knows it and he saves you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Did Jesus lie? It's John 6, 47. Did he lie? Truly, truly, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The free gift is based solely upon your trust and what Jesus did for you and has nothing at all to do what you do for him. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. If it had anything to do with us, we could boast. All right, and he calls this uh, chapter here, The Great Habit Wrong. Uh, so I'm, I'm going through the uh, introduction. He says, the primary purpose of this book is fourfold. One, to educate you about salvation, i.e. going to heaven using the King James Version of the Bible. Two, to show you examples of what the Bible says are false plans of salvation. Three, to compare and to contrast the salvation statements of several of today's top pastors and Bible teachers with the salvation statements that are found in the Bible. So we're going to uh, uh, compare what these preachers, these big pastors are teaching you versus what the simplicity of Christ is in the Bible. Salvific verses of how, how to be saved in the Bible, the Bible way to heaven. Okay? And four, to allow you to make up your own mind as to whom you will choose to believe when it comes to where you'll spend eternity. With these goals firmly in mind, let us now shift gears in some relevant initial material for you to digest, much like an appetizer before the main course. So, who am I and how did all this come about? On the night of November 14, 2006, my mother approached me with the challenge of writing a book about what Christ said about salvation and revealing the false messages being taught by the, quote, great preachers of our time. She said, Mike, you need to let people know the real deal about what Christ said about eternal life and how to get it. 
Immediately something within me clicked. I developed a tremendous burden to tell Christ's plans of salvation so that no one would be deceived. The dream of this book was born out of that burden. By the way, my channel was born of the same burden. I spent many nights uh, in the Word of God. And, and it's almost as if these verses came alive out of the book. It was amazing. Christ is of no effect to you. Christ, he is dead in vain. And I was like, how many people in the church are lost? And that's why I began a ministry to get people saved. And the scary thing is that most of the people that get saved are already in the churches. You know? So that's why he said uh, a lot of good kids are harmed mentally, emotionally, and spiritually uh, at, at certain schools, uh, Christian academies, and John MacArthur's little workshops and stuff. Because um, they're constantly... You know, it's law. It makes us guilty. All right. Uh, so let me, I'm going to go through this. And, uh, oh, he said, I found some articles by Dr. Hank Lindstrom. I just mentioned him. Uh, he's amazing. He said that he listened to his sermon, How Permanent Is Your Salvation? Uh, and it's absolutely amazing. It, it really is. Look that video up. Uh, let's see. We're not going to read this whole chapter here. This was just to let you know why he did this. And he, then he goes into, and I'll do a short thing on o Osteen. Okay, this will be the first one of the chapters. Let's see how much time we have here. We're at 21 minutes. Hopefully you can bear with me. Uh, he says, a plan of salvation according to Joel Osteen. So this is the first pastor we're going to get into. And he says, if you, he's very nice about him. If you've ever had a bad day or if you've lost hope, then listen to a message by Joel Osteen. And I guarantee that you'll be inspired by what he says. I have nothing but praise for this man. His positive messages of hope and the tone of voice in which he delivers his thought-provoking words of comfort to those who really, really need a hand up in this dire world. But that doesn't mean it saves you, you know. He says, Joel Osteen is the pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, and his television shows can be seen most every day on a number of channels, as well as on a number of inter internet pages. I see Joel Osteen better as a self-help person, not a Bible teacher. I see him using the Bible. He'll pull a concept out of the Bible and make it applicable to self-help. That's what I see. Uh, so he's just saying a lot of people watch him. They are really uh, uh, feeling good about it. But then he says at the end of each show, Joe Osteen would tell his audience that everyone needed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he instructed everyone to repent of their sins and make Jesus their Lord and Savior. By the way, he is Lord. No one can call Jesus Lord except be by the Holy Ghost. So once Holy Spirit's in you, he becomes your Lord. He is the Lord. Okay. Uh, name above all names. He still teaches the same message today. At the end of every service. Now, in my case, as a result of watching Osteen, and because I was so hungry to know for sure where I'd spend eternity, I did exactly what he said to do at every every end of every show, which is to repent of sin. It would he thought he was. Nobody's ever done that. Uh, if we have to repent of our sins, we're all lost because nobody does that perfectly. Uh, to, that's the law. Thus, ask Jesus into my heart and make him both my Lord and Savior. By the way, none of that's biblical. You'll find none of this, none of repenting of sin to be saved. Repentance unto life, change your mind and believe on Jesus. Repentance of dead works and of faith towards God, uh, but you won't see repent of sin to be saved. And these new Bibles put change your heart and lives. No, no, no. That That's your works. See, we're supposed to turn, change our mind and believe on what Jesus did. Just like Peter told the Jews, repent and believe the gospel. Repent that this... This man you crucified is both Lord and Christ. Oh, what do we do? Repent, believe the gospel. Stop wanting him dead and believe on him. Uh, but people just add of your sins to that word repent, and that's very, very unfortunate. Uh, if it says repent of your wicked ways, it means repent of your wicked ways, but it doesn't say that. All right, so he said, I was never born again according to the way Osteen said we had to be born again. But I was happier as a result because the opinion of myself changed. I was empowered. I felt better about who I was as a person. Of course, when you get rid of sin, your life feel better. Yet I had died by believing in Osteen's plan of salvation. I would never have made it to heaven, according to the Bible. What's the problem here? 
What is the problem arise from a mere lack of understanding of what Mr. Osteen says to do? Or could it be that what Mr. Osteen's telling us to do is not even found in the Bible at all? And what shall we use in order to determine the answers to such questions? For the answers to the questions, let us look at the Greek translation of the English word repent, as well as look at some key verses about salvation in the Bible. However, before we do this, I have to say on the authority of the Word of God, not my opinion, and with a very disappointed feeling in having to say these things about someone who has meant so much to me in the past, he likes him. I can say most strongly that Mr. Osteen unknowingly, unknowingly, he's not accusing him and calling him names, he's just saying he unknowingly provides an unbiblical counterfeit plan of salvation to both the members of his church and to his worldwide audience at the end of every presentation, and that I honestly believe that no one's ever explained to him how to be saved. It's weird because uh, Joseph Prince, like one of his best friends, he should know better, and Joseph Prince comes against this repenting of says garbage. All right? That, like so many others in the Christian business, simply copy each other's plans of salvation in order to sound similar so as not to be seen as different from the mainstream. All right? So he thinks he's doing it without realizing it because it, in Isaiah it says the blind who lead the blind, according to Jesus' own words, fall into the ditch. Yet in the most disappointing sense, these spiritually blind teachers are followers of a counterfeit plan of salvation. They're the ones who end up standing before Christ at the great white throne judgment after a lifetime of honestly trying their best to get their lives together, of trying their best to do the right thing, of trying to live for Christ the best way they know how to do. Their reward is not an eternity in heaven with the Lord they sought so longingly to live for. Rather, according to Jesus himself, their eternity be one of endless suffering, loss, and torment because they trusted in their works. They trusted in turning away from their sins and bad habits and living the Christian life in addition to faith as Christ is their means to enter heaven rather than placing their trust alone with no works in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection from the grave the way Christ said to do is their only hope of escaping eternal damnation. Osteen's not the enemy, folks, but Osteen is being used by the enemy to lead all who believe in another gospel into a Christless eternity. It is my firm belief that neither Osteen nor his followers understand the destination where self-effort and lordship salvation will eventually take them eternally. So with a heavy heart, yet with tremendous hope in the power of God to show everyone what Christ says about salvation, let us now reason together using the anchor of God's word in comparison to what Osteen says has to say regarding salvation. And maybe these Bible truths contained in this chapter will cut through the satanic deceptions of lordship salvation, as well as erroneous definition of repentance that is adhered to by so many pastors today. And as a result, will help to open everyone's eyes to Christ's truth, which in case I haven't said already, is my true aim. And he confirms that he's uh, uh, very inspiring, he's a wonderful, you know, uh, motivator and self-help dude, but he can't give you salvation. He says, salvation, according to Joel Osteen, consists, consists of this, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Osteen says, says we must, one, repent of sins. <laughs> who's ever done that? Like, if you really look at yourself, who's ever repented of all their sins? And what do you do about the sins of omission? And the sins you don't know you commit. What about pride? What about looking at a woman with love? Okay. <clears throat> Two, ask Jesus into your hearts. Nowhere in scripture. You know why? Because when you trust in Christ, he does dwell in your heart because the seed of Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit. Uh, three, ask him to wash us clean. Well, his blood does that. So when you receive him, the blood does wash you clean. Four, make him our Lord and Savior. Now, according to the Bible, this is not how to go to heaven. What this is, however, is a blueprint for discipleship. Thank you. People are preaching service and discipleship in order to be saved. Pick up your cross. Count the cost. Okay, that, that you do that once you are saved. Okay, that doesn't save you. That's your works. You got to count the cost and pick up your cross. That's of you and it's works. I don't know why people can't get that. More accurately, what we really need is a Savior. When you become born again through faith alone in Christ, you're automatically in a relationship with Jesus the very instant you trust in what he did for you by his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. That's why I said no one called Jesus Lord except be the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it says, 
the very instant you trust for his, de uh, his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. To say that we need a relationship with Christ is not an accurate statement. We need salvation in order to escape the wrath of God. Not a relationship. Okay, first things first. Don't put the cart before the horse. You need a savior first. You got to get out from under the wrath of God. He who believes the Son has life. He who believes not the Son has not life. And the wrath of God abides on him. We got to get from out of that. Okay? How do we do that? Trusting in Christ. All right, let's get that straight first. Now, Osteen preaches our need for discipleship-based relationship with Christ. Salvation is vastly different from discipleship. And that discipleship requires hard work. Whereas salvation requires only your trust and the promise of everlasting life that Christ extends to all of us by his grace. Okay? They mock it. I don't care. I don't, they just don't get it. For God will be it be into them that are lost. Let them mock it. The Bible says different. Quite literally, Jesus saves you the instant you trust in what he did for you. A lot of people go to the Old Covenant under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus is speaking to Israel under the law, showing them how they fail at keeping the law and hinting at the eternal life that he's offering through his death, burial, and resurrection. And they try to take that stuff under the law and make it uh, stuff about discipleship and try to put that to salvation under grace. Makes no sense. That's why you got to rightly divide the word of God. So salvation is what God did for you and nothing of yourself. Okay? None of your works enters into the contract. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Imagine you're about to buy a home. Are you about to sign the contract? You cross out the price and you insert a lower price. Will the seller of the home honor that contract? No. Why? See, the price was high. It was paid in Jesus' blood. So if you mark out Jesus' blood and put... Uh, partly his blood and partly this. God's not going to accept that. Do you see it? That's what he's trying to tell you. He does a great job there. No, of course not. You have violated the terms of the contract. In the same way, a pastor who crosses out the terms of God's contract, meaning the blood of Christ, which is the only thing that takes away sin, and then puts the blood of Christ plus whatever, you turning from sin, you living the good life, you whatever, it's not going to be accepted, okay? It's only Jesus' blood on the mercy seat of heaven, and you have to receive it first. got to be saved. It says the pastor who crosses out the terms of God's contract and adds different terms to the contract. That contract's void. It will not stand. What is free and available to all by grace through faith is hijacked by the addition of human efforts. In no way can a person's good works and deeds be added to the contract. God will not honor such a contract. And if you die under the terms of your own works-based contract, which essentially makes you the Savior and not Christ, you will stand before him at the great white throne judgment. And guess what you'll hear? I never knew you. Okay? Now, one of the reasons Osteen's plan of salvation is not biblical is due to the misuse of the word repent. The New Testament was written predominantly in the Greek language. The definition of the word repent in the Greek language is different from how it's defined in the English language. When Christ told people to repent, he was telling them to, quote, change their minds about what they were currently believing in quote, works of the law, to get them into heaven, and to instead trust in him alone to get them into heaven. The Greek word for repent is metanoia, which means, quote, a change of mind. It has nothing at all to do with turning from sins. To consciously turn from your sins involves a great amount of self-effort and resolve. It's works, okay? It takes effort to put down that bottle of alcohol. It takes effort to quit smoking cigarettes. It takes work to quit a drug habit. It takes great effort to not get angry at someone who's wronged you or to stop lusting, lying, cheating, or to keep the Ten Commandments, etc. It's your works because sin is transgression of the law. To repent of sin is to repent of breaking God's law or keep God's law. It's the same thing. That, dear reader, is works-based salvation and goes against what Christ teaches despite how wholesome and good it sounds. Did you hear me? Despite how good it sounds. The English word repent, according to just about any English dictionary, is turn from sin or feel regret or feel sorrow. By the way, there is a Greek word for uh, feeling sorrowful, and it is metamalomai, and that's not being used here. So he's just saying uh, that, that it's Satan's to blame, ultimately, because he knew that was a way to add works to salvation, which would make the contract Void. Do you see the subtlety that beguiled Eve here? So essentially, he's saying 
uh, it's a really long thing. I've done tons of stuff on the word repent and which words are being used and what they mean in the Greek. Uh, so that the already already was done. Uh, so he said, when a pastor uses the English version of repent rather than Christ version of repent, which is based upon the meaning of the Greek translation, a form of works entered into the equation sub subsequently nullifies the free gift of salvation. Why? Because you've offered a different contract that has works because your righteousness is a filthy rag. And Isaiah says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And if you think that works will help you because you're filthy rags righteousness or you think anything of self will aid you in getting into heaven or if any combination of faith in Christ plus your good deeds will count in God's eyes, I want you to look very closely at this particular verse. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 13, 39. The hymn in this verse is referring to none other than Jesus Christ. In both of the aforementioned verses, we are told outrightly by the Holy Spirit, who wrote the Bible using the ink and scrolls of people, that under no circumstances whatsoever can our good deeds and righteous works, discipleship, be used as a bargaining chip. What is deceptive in most of all today's ministries is the ubiquitous and egregiously wrong usage of three of the most straightforward verses in the Bible concerning salvation. John 3.16, Ephesians 2.8.9, and John 3.16. 16 states, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2 H 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. While I have yet to see Osteen use either of these verses in his sermon, although I'm sure he's used them at some point in his career as a pastor, the point I'm trying to make is that every pastor who used these verses and then at the end of their message says you must repent of your sins, quit sinning in order to be saved, is actually changing God's contract by adding works to the clear plan of salvation by faith alone and Christ alone, that each of these verses allude to or state emphatically is the only means by which we are saved. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ, and deceive many. So many will admit he's Christ, and then they will deceive you with a false plan of salvation. Christ cannot lie. The Bible cannot lie. You do not have to get a relationship or discipleship with Jesus to be saved. You don't have to turn from your sins to be saved, and you don't make him Lord of your life. You simply trust God's word, his promise, that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gives eternal life. It is only his blood that makes you worthy, and then God imputes his righteousness on you by faith. Then he also does this. He has members of his audience stand up and make their decision public as he leads them in his version of the salvation prayer. This is this sinner's prayer nonsense, which is nowhere in scripture, implying that if they did not stand up in his service, that Christ would be ashamed of him before his father. Yet, as as oblivious as he is that his followers are, this act of standing up and making a public decision is yet another, quote, good work that cancels out God's grace in terms of salvation, because it's one more instance of something of self that both Acts 13.39 and Ephesians 2.8.9 clearly state as being wrong. Uh, it, it's it's very deceptive, people. Uh, God knows if you have trusted in Jesus alone as your Savior. He says, notice how I use God and Christ interchangeably. The reason I do this because Jesus said he and the Father are one. If you've seen him, you've also seen the Father. That throws a lot of people off. What I tell people to do is think of God as they would of an egg. An egg has three basic parts, essentially. An egg has one, a shell, two, a white, and three, a yolk. All its three basic parts, it's still one egg. Similarly, we have one God, the Father, two God, the Son, and three God, the Holy Spirit. Praise God. There are three unique personalities. God is still one God. When Jesus Christ took on human flesh, he was literally God in a body. That's why it's called Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, I'm sick of the false people denying his divinity and preexistence because it's very clear in Scripture. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he created all things. He had glory with the Father before the world was, before Abraham was, I am, etc., etc. Uh, so here's some more. He says, I said, therefore unto you, this is Jesus speaking, that ye shall die in your sins 
For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. If you don't believe that he is the Savior, you will die in your sins. So he makes the condition about trust, about believing. And he says, I don't believe I stand, understands that his plan of salvation is different from the plan of salvation that God offers through faith alone in his son, Jesus. I think he just doesn't understand the simplicity of salvation that's found in the Bible in Christ alone. And so he says, Satan will cause a pastor to be so concerned with his image and standing in society that if even an unbelieving pastor got born again, he may never admit to this to his audience for fear that he'd lose his credibility, his salary, his position, and maybe even his wife. He said, Osteen is so wonderful in every way, but he just can't get people saved. So he said, what will salvation according to Joel Osteen get you? Jesus says, this is what it'll get you. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name done cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew seven twenty one. But it doesn't have to be this way. Look what Jesus says to us. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Christ is very, very clear about his trust alone requirement. Christ cannot lie. Christ says no works, but Osteen says works. He says, I'll leave the choice to you about whom you'll believe. This was very long, but it's very important that I do this. This is the first of many. The others will not be as long because I'm going to go straight into each pastor and uh, make a whole video series of this. All right? God bless.